everyone, and welcome to Untamed Unfiltered. I'm Amanda Nicholson. And my name is Aaron Provencio, and today we are joined by two very special guests, Leslie Sturgis and Linda McDaniel. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Aaron and Amanda. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us as we dive a little bit deeper into our wildlife rehabilitation episode. Uh, so we were pretty excited to uh, put this in our season two lineup of Untamed, uh, just really the, the chance to shine a spotlight on the wonderful wildlife rehabilitation community that we have in Virginia and, and really throughout the United States, but um, definitely us talking a little bit more about the daily life of wildlife rehabilitators and all the amazing work that goes on. Um, so I guess just to set us up a little bit, can you guys share or remind us, Leslie, you were in this episode, um, but just what, how long have you been rehabbing? What sorts of animals do you care for? Sure, um, I think I am at 20 years this year. Um, yeah, and I have always specialized particularly in bats, all native bat species. And then I have um, occasionally let a box turtle or two sneak in. <laughs> They're very stealthy. Yeah, they <laughs> are. They just, you know, creep right in. And then you're like, oh, look at you. You need an entirely different setup. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, started rehabilitating when I was 13 years old. It was the youngest they would allow volunteers to come in um, to the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. So that has been 40 years ago, which is, um, wow. Um, so I've only been doing, here in Virginia, in my home, I've only been rehabbing for three years. This is my third season. Um, I specifically deal right now with Eastern cottontails. Um, I certainly will admit other animals. I have rehabbed everything from fawns to eagles to even bear cubs, um, skunks and possums, squirrels. But typically in my home right now, I only really do Eastern cottontails. Awesome. Must be very quiet and zen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as we mentioned a little bit in the episode, and Virginia has a certain permitting system that um, rehabbers such as yourselves have to make sure that you're going through to to live up with the rules and regs of the different um, systems they have in place. And obviously each state is different, but I'm curious for the both of you, when you were going through the process of getting that permit to do your own at-home rehabilitation, was that, was that difficult for you? Like, what did that process look like? Well, for me, because it was back in the dark ages here in Virginia, it was pretty straightforward. I had a sponsor, they signed off on me, I sent in my application and they're, there I was, I had my permit. Um, so there've been changes over the years and mostly for the better. There's more education requirements up front, um, but it's a two year apprenticeship program. And then you, if your sponsor deems that you know enough, then your sponsor can submit a letter to allow you to get your own category two permit here in Virginia. And then you're on your own. But we do have a pretty decent network of people who help out that really does make the transition from being um, an apprentice to being on your own a lot easier. So I think, I think we have a good system here in the state. So yeah, so I got my at home permit just three years ago. So it was, um, it was an interesting experience. There are times when um, I felt it really, really helpful. There was a lot of support from other rehabbers. Um, I find that the people that are in charge um, at Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries will respond very quickly to emails. So that was very helpful. There was other times when it was kind of um, where I felt like it wasn't clear enough on different things that I needed to make sure that I had done. I like to check boxes off and I was a little disarmed by the lack of boxes to check off and trying to read all of the different parts to make sure that I had everything done correctly. I, um, overall, I think it's a good system. I think it's very important that people get supported in this. It is um, taking care of wild animals is not the same thing as taking care of domestic animals. Um, there's a lot more to it than most of us realize going into it. There's just so much to learn. It's a very evolving. Um, profession and science and so there's things change from one year to the other things will change um, um, standards of practice change medications change formula changes housing requirements change 
And of course, every species needs their own thing. And so lots to learn. Um, so that was good. There's lots of lots of help. Um, it's not, it's, it's just a little bit, you know, you just really, I felt like I really needed that support. I needed people to say, hey, you know, check this paragraph, make sure. Um, but, you know, mostly I felt confident. I had rehab for a while, so I kind of knew what I needed to have, physically have. So, and once I navigated the check boxes and got things done, I was really happy with the results. I think it's important that people understand that this is evolving. You have to do continuing education. You have to have that network of people to help you. You have to maintain those standards and be prepared for learning all the time and making those changes as they're necessary. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, if I could just add a little bit to that, I think that having a, um, a national network to tap into also is very helpful because there are people across the country who might be dealing with different things at different times of the year and maybe someone's seen something. Um, I think being hidebound to any particular way of doing things is a mistake. I think we constantly have to understand that as knowledge changes, our abilities change and we should be looking for, you know, a better way all the time. Maybe there isn't a better way, but keep looking because we know none of us are, I'm not a bat, Linda's not a cotton tail. We, you know, we do our best, but there are gonna be gaps there. And I think the only way to really to try and fill those gaps is with more and more knowledge. Yeah, and I would, I would agree as well that the importance of being a part of the state network, the national network, um, you know, the National Wildlife Rehabilitation um, the International Wildlife Rehabilitation State, all of those networks to people, whether they're on Facebook or web pages or blogs or whatever, so critical for that information. You know, that, that just, um, there's really no way that I could be successful at what I do if I didn't have that support system. Yeah. Well, I love that continuing education came up so much in this episode too. I think um, this has been a fun, a fun season for me because with our, when we arrange our outside experts, um, when we interview you guys, uh, we certainly come up with the questions that our producer asks, but like we, we don't really know what all you're going to say. I mean, we have a general idea, but like how you answer something or, you know, what's important to you or whatever, that's, that's all from you guys. So in seeing the episode come together, it was, uh, it was cool seeing some common threads of like, oh yeah, we did not plan that. Um, nobody knew what each other was going to say, but uh, multiple people emphasized what you guys just said, continuing education and just that constant evolution of knowledge because we're still learning so much about the species themselves, uh, much less like the rehabilitation techniques on top of that and best practices and just always wanting to improve and, and always do better for the animals in our care. And I thought it was great that um, the DGIF Aaron, so not, not this Aaron, but uh, <laughs> the um, Department of Game and Inland Fisheries uh, Aaron was in this episode and talking about rehabbers and um, basically called them subject matter experts because rehabbers are the ones that know all of these different facets of natural history and what normal behavior is and a wild diet and how you transition that into a diet in captivity. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you guys come to know what you know now? Well, um, it's been a journey. Um, I was lucky enough to just always be like into critters that people don't love as much. Mm -hmm. So bats were kind of a natural fit. And when I realized that I worked at National Zoo, and when I realized that I was never ever going to be the bat zookeeper, because they were in with lions and tigers and me. Um, so I just really started delving into how does one go about becoming a bat person without having to go back to grad school. So um, I found Bat World Sanctuary in Texas and they were doing a one week intensive bat rehabilitation course and it was called Bat Boot Camp. So I took that and then from there, because that was very rehabilitation focused um, and my interests are not just in rehabilitation, I'm always into the everything about the animal. So I want, you know, I want to know the behaviors and I want to know what are they doing out there in the world when they're not with us. So I started going to um, a lot of conferences. So it was like information by osmosis, sitting there listening to people who 
knew more than I do. And also being unafraid to plop myself down in a room full of PhDs. I mean, and I think that's the, you gotta have a little bit of moxie to try to kind of worm your way into places where you might not be accepted. I mean, wildlife rehabilitation has been looked at as sort of a weird thing that, that little ladies do in their basement. And, uh, and I think we know that's not true at all. Yeah. Um, there's a wide variety of people in facilities doing this. So it was like just being willing to go like, hey, no, I do this thing. And we release, you know, 85% of our juveniles every year. So it's not a waste of time. And, and then I think there, over the years, there's been an acknowledgement and that rehabilitation and research go together. And so now, you know, I get to present at conferences myself, places where I used to be terrified of those people. And now I talk to them. So it's a fabulous and wonderful thing. And conferences with other rehabilitators are equally as important as those um, conferences where you run into subject matter people. So I think just being there and absorbing as much knowledge as you can directly from people is mm -hmm. terrific. And then I do read a lot of journal articles, like way probably too many. <laughs> um, so the Eastern cottontail is kind of a different species than bats. People don't tend to be quite as fascinated with cottontails. Um, bats are really like, you know, flying mice and they're super cool. They're not mice, by the way, don't come to that. <laughs> Um, I'm going to correct you right there, lady. <laughs> I know they're not mice, Leslie, I know. Um, <laughs> but people are super fascinated with, you know, different kinds of species, and most people are not particularly interested in eastern cottontails. In the rehabilitation world, they're kind of known as those things that just die. Um, they're really hard to maintain. We have this, like, hop, hop, die story. Um, because they just like will be dead for no reason at all, as far as you can tell. And most people just don't seem like, you know, they try, but there's, there's not that huge, people are not having conferences about Eastern cottontails. It's just, it's not a thing. Um, so it's really been, um, when I just, I decided to really focus on Eastern cottontails because I found them so interesting. They're so fascinating. Like, how can it be that we have this, these, this species and, you know, similar species out there that, people just don't know that much about. I mean, there's lots of papers that I've read and there's really no books on the Eastern cottontail. There's no conferences on them. There's just this kind of overwhelming sense of, well, you know, it's okay because there's a lot of them and, you know, they don't do well in captivity and so they die and, you know, oh well, you know, they're really sensitive, too bad. Um, and so it's, I, I found that frustrating to the point that I just couldn't accept that as an answer. Like, that's just not an acceptable option for me to just say, well, you just can't do it. Um, and so I became really fascinated in the species. Um, I, when I first kind of initially started this journey in this species, I really like, I asked people to send me all of their notes. I asked people for papers. I went online. I did as much research as I could. I talked to rehabbers all over the planet. I wanted to know what their protocol was, why they had it established, what their results were, um, what their mortality rate was, what were their biggest challenges. And I really kind of went, you know, digging deep in that hole of like, what are you doing and why are you doing it and what are your results and how can I use that as well? Um, and so I kind of, I learned a lot from other people. And then as I started to implement this myself and say, well, here's the protocol that most people are using. Let's try this. Let's try that. Let's read some more papers. Let's find out about this tricky little sequin that they have going on and why it's such a problem. And all of this kind of stuff about bunnies. Um, and there's a lot of information out there, but it's not as much as in journal articles as it is in anecdotal information. There's rehabbers everywhere that are doing fantastic work, but they're not publishing the papers. Um, what I do find, I think Amanda can back me up, lots of people that do this kind of work, um, although we are not all little old ladies in our basement with baby births or whatever, um, they don't always like to stand up in front of other people or publish papers and talk to people about what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and so there's good stuff out there, but you do have to search for it for this species anyway. So, um, you know, and, and I think we all want to talk about our critters. I mean, we all fundamentally love animals and want to do the right thing for them. Um, and so and we want to protect the species and we want to contribute to conservation and we want to teach other people. Um, so it was really a lot of really spending some time in front of the computer and emailing and calling and, and reading. Um, 
So it's been quite a journey and it, it, it you know, three, three years of just this species and it is evolving. It is, I'm doing some research this week and I'm going to try to publish a paper on different things that I found this particular season because I'm, I'm having some different results this year. Um, and of course we have rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus two, which wow. has entered our country and is sweeping the nation tragically. And that's going to make a huge impact in my practice probably next year. Um, and I wouldn't know anything about it if I weren't out there asking and reading and talking to people. So, you know, tons of information out there. You just, you got to dig and you got to dig deep. You know, um, I just want to just, because Linda brought something up about the rabbit hemorrhagic fever too. Mm -hmm. uh, does my, <laughs> my vet who comes out and takes care of livestock hadn't even heard of it. Oh. And I, a bat rehabilitator, knew about it mm -hmm. because you know i think us rehabbers really do sort of it goes all the way back to that one health thing if you're working with your vet your wildlife vet and keeping up with those wildlife communities mm -hmm. then you do know things and then you can you know help like now my livestock vet knows that there's a rabbit thing probably coming down the pike and you know she might herself not treat rabbits as she informed me but anyway, um, but you know, she'll pass that on to the other vets who do. So I think that's where we actually play a bigger role than just our, our animal that we deal with. Yeah, yeah. And to, add on to, to add on to that, Leslie, I had the exact same results. I contacted my local vet. Um, I have a non-releasable rabbit and I was looking, I, I don't know if, we don't even know if this vaccine will work on a wild rabbit, um, but I contacted my local vet about it. They hadn't heard of it either. They had no idea that this virus was sweeping the Southwest of the United States right now and, you know, annihilating up to 90% of our wild populations. Um, oh, wow. And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, we, we play a bigger role than, you know, feeding cottontails. Um, it's a much larger role than I think I ever anticipated. Yeah. Also, Leslie, congratulations for bringing up One Health. I feel like at this point in our, um, our episodes here, we need like a bell to go off and like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I feel like we have this like unofficial, I don't know, bet or game with ourselves here of like, it just keeps coming up in every single like untamed unfiltered that we do in a very yeah. natural, like yeah. you're not bringing it up. But uh, so you did it. So yeah, go in uh, seven for seven or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's very cool too because, like Amanda was saying, it's this unintentional theme all throughout season two. Our first episode of Untamed was One Health, and seemingly we're discussing all of these wide-ranging conservation issues with every single episode, but they all play into this larger One Health umbrella. And although this episode of Untamed doesn't necessarily seem like it plays into sort of this idea because we've been doing litter and lead poisoning and um, all of these different aspects and it might not seem like wildlife rehabilitation plays into it but as you two have so eloquently pointed out wildlife rehabilitation is extremely important not only for the research aspects and also just the fact that you're able to take care of these animals that need help help but we're able to learn a lot working together in this in this field of wildlife rehabilitation. I'm just curious, and we might go into this a little bit later, but what um, what do you really see as the value of what you, you two do? Oh, I tell you, for me, the most important thing we do is we give people an outlet for their care and compassion. Mm -hmm. And through that, we are reconnecting people to nature and I think we can all admit there's a giant wedge that's been driven because of the way we live on the planet here in the U.S. I can't speak for any other country but for us we're mostly rapidly urbanizing and people are in their houses and they're watching screens and they're not out there farming or hunting or doing any of those traditional things and through rehabilitation instead of let nature take its course when there's no nature as far as the eye can see. Um, we allow people to, to connect with nature. We allow them to learn in a way that they feel comfortable because they're helping. And so I think that the 
outlet for care and concern, compassion, all that stuff, it, it's making that connection. And until we can really connect people with our environment and the places where we live, where nature is everywhere, even if you don't see it or you don't notice it, it's there. I, until we can really amplify that, I think all our yabbity yabbity talking and, you know, websites and all that kind of stuff, we're not going to do it. It takes that personal connection that's going to, to bring people to protecting the environment and doing things that are good for everyone, not just animals and not just people. So, yeah, I mean, I, gosh, adding on to that, I guess I would say, you know, I just kind of go back to the VGIF thing of like, um, you know, protect, conserve, and educate. I mean, this is, this is really my role. I see as a lot of education. Um, I'm a professional educator by trade. I taught high school for 21 years. And so that's what I think I do probably the most is talking to people, sharing information with people, allowing people to have an understanding of things on that basic level that's going to connect them to that concern. Like there is something you can do. Um, it's not an issue of like, well, there's just nothing you can do. Um, there is lots you can do. Um, you can bring a baby animal or an injured animal to a rehabilitator that they can give qualified care that's going to actually save the animal, hopefully. Um, you know, you can, you know, teach people that, you know, you cannot give cow's milk to baby bunnies. You cannot um, handle bats with your bare hands. You cannot keep a bear cub in your garage. This is, this is are all no. You cannot do any of those things for the animal. You know, for the animal, these are why we don't do these things. If we love wildlife, we turn them over to people that can help save them and protect them. Um, so I think of uh, my job as mostly education, um, whether it's educating myself about the best way to rehab an Eastern cottontail, um, or it's educating the public on what they can do. You know, these simple things, that, you know, people love to help. People want to help. Um, overall, people are generally nice to little tiny animals. That, you know, I mean, you know, most people are, and most people want to help. And if you give them something they can physically do, they will do it. They will bring an animal. They will transport an animal. Um, they will knit little crocheted nests for your animals. They will. <laughs> they will donate. You know, tissue boxes. And I mean, they will help if they can. And so, a lot of this is education you know, why should you care? And, you know, it goes back to this overarching theme of we're all connected. We're all a part of this. This is, this is important, whether you know it or not. And so I'm going to tell you one way that it is, whether it's for your health, the quality of your water, the quality of your air, the quality of your, you know, your peace of mind, the quality of, of your food system. All of these things are important. They're important to us as a species. Um, on this planet, whether or not we know of it. So I would say education is probably my biggest role. Yeah, that was one of those other great little things that popped up in this episode was hearing both um, Aaron at DGIF and Leslie in their very different, totally filmed on way different days, different locations. Um, both of them brought up that word of connection and connecting people to wildlife, which I just thought was so great. And I think, I mean, we generally feel that too. It's not, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes people are like, why bother to save that squirrel or bunny or like, there's lots of them and it's not going to impact the population one way or the other. And like, sure, it might not, but it's, uh, we are providing a public service. We are connecting people, we're educating people, and and just kind of bringing it all together. And I thought uh, Leslie's factoid too of um, looking at the 2018 numbers of wildlife rehabilitation cases in Virginia, um, 23,000 wild animals <laughs> in 2018 by the whole network in Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's like 23,000 connections between people and wildlife and wildlife rehabilitation, which is so cool. It is, and you know, and that's also just, that's just the animals. If you think about how many phone calls we handle that don't even result in an animal coming in, I mean, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of connections this group makes with people. And, you know, and right now for me, because we've got these COVID restrictions in place and I cannot accept bats for 
the fear that we as humans could give COVID to bats. And so it's pup season. They're raining down out of bat boxes and louvers. And so what we've had to do is give people a way that they can try to get those babies back. And whereas in years past, you could beg, please put it back with its mother. And the nope, here it would go to the wildlife center and then it would come to me, right? Well, um, now people are doing that. They are going through those steps it takes to reunite. So I think that that, that groundwork we've done through these past years and reaching out and making all those connections and talking to people has actually created a situation where now this year that things are so different and so heartbreaking, but people are trying. And I think that is just a huge, like real time lesson in what we've been able to accomplish. Cool. And now I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I love the babies. <laughs> Well, I think it's pretty incredible. I mean, before I got involved in the, the kind of world of wildlife rehab, I had no idea that this was going on in so many pockets of, of, of not only Virginia, but across the country. And it's pretty amazing how many people like yourselves have the passion and the will and the drive to get involved in this. And in a way, although as you were pointing out, there's this larger network of rehabilitators that are able to exchange information and support each other, being a wildlife rehabilitator on your own is also a very individualistic endeavor, right? It's a very personal journey. And Leslie, in the episode, you sort of spoke to the best and also the most challenging aspects of wildlife rehabilitation. And so I'm curious, Leslie, if you wanted to go a little bit more into that, and then also Linda, I guess the same question goes to you as well. So, yeah, I think it can be a very lonely um, existence when you're a home-based rehabilitator because there isn't a staff there you know your vet's not on site so if you've got a challenge you might actually have to sit there and flail a little bit trying to figure out you know what do I do next um fortunately Dr. Kara hasn't given me her personal cell phone number but Dr. <laughs> Peach did so I would just text her whenever and um anyway <laughs> but but there is like there you are often and um well i mean i it doesn't matter what time of day like i'm up in the middle of the night two in the morning feeding a bunch of babies who really have no idea what i'm trying to do with them and there's no one you can bounce that off of at that moment um but but you know you get them all fed and you get your little bit of sleep and you snivel and whine to yourself and you talk about you know how much you've struggled and there's somebody out there who's willing to hear you, another rehabber who's going through the same thing. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm exhausted, blah, blah, blah. But you know, we get through it and then you let everybody go and you're like, yeah, I did this awesome thing. And I think that's, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges are, are deep and, and difficult, but the reward is just so amazing. And uh, you get to do this thing that like very few other people I mean, on a, you know, if you look at per percentage of population, we are a tiny little group of people who are doing truly huge and amazing things. So I think that's, there's just like this little, yay, us. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Leslie. Um, you know, the chat, the, well, Dr. Cara, I do have her personal cell number and um, she hears from me all the time, the poor woman. Um, Oh, gosh, I don't know. The biggest challenges I this year, and I in previous years, I think the biggest challenge for me is when I don't know the answer, when I have a mortality um, and I don't know what's going on and I can't figure it out. And there's not research out there. Again, there's there's definitely an attitude of, well, you know, bunnies just die. What are you gonna do? Um, and so I find that the most frustrating for me when I am trying every protocol out there when I am working, when I am emailing, when I'm calling, when I am searching and I'm not finding answers. What is going on? That I find really frustrating. Um, I do tend to be somewhat goal oriented. And so when I can't achieve that and I don't know why I can't achieve it, then it's really like, okay, dig in the heels in. Um, there are moments um, 
you know, when you do have mortality, when your patients are dying and you don't know what's going on, that there are certainly moments where it's, I can't do this. I cannot take, I cannot take these animals in and just have them die. Um, I have to find the answer. I have to know what's going on. Um, I'd say that is probably my largest challenge. Um, people have been fantastic. Um, my poor husband listens to me talk about bunnies and formula and bunny poop and <sighs> the bunny GI system and all sorts of things and people that keep bunny napping and people leaving their cats outside and saying, well, that's just how it goes um, and all of that. And so he gets the full brunt of the ad nauseum um, deal from me. <laughs> so it's so, so a poor thing. He now knows more about rabbits than he ever wanted to. Um, so I, I think that's probably my biggest frustration. People have been fantastic. Um, veterinarians have been great help to me. Um, other rehabbers have been a huge support. Um, I have a woman that, um, who's a Virginia master naturalist and she runs the website Wild Foods for Wildlife. She brings me tons of natural foods every week, huge bins of wild greens. Bunnies are of course herbivores and so they eat a ton of food. Um, and so that's been fantastic. Um, my husband, in addition to listening to me night and day, um, also has done great work. He's put shelves in, he built a whole bunny rehab shed. He did, you know, he's done all of that physical manual labor. Um, I have, of course have supervised really well. And so, you know, put that there, don't do that anymore. Um, and so <laughs> that's, um, but I think for me, that's the biggest challenge. I, you know, the, the, the real benefits are when I, um, in all education, there's a moment where you're trying to express something, trying to have some understanding, some connection with another person, and you get that light bulb, and they get what you're saying. And so when you talk to them about, you know, uh, cats as an invasive species and how it's decimating our wildlife, and, you know, these injuries that I just got a, um, a cat attacked bunny the other day and so and um the gentleman's like oh and it'll you know it looks really good it's jumping around and doing you know bunny things and it's like that's fantastic and um that's what bunnies typically do unfortunately the bunny has a uh, puncture wounds and degloving and a fractured skull and all of these things because that's what cats do um and so but when you talk to someone and you get that light bulb of understanding, um, much like teaching ninth and 10th graders, you know, when they suddenly get it, you're like, yay. <laughs> and so and that's, that's a huge deal for me. That's a big carrot and carrot for me right there. Um, and also the your release day, you know, when those bunnies are ready to go and I watch them hop off into the field and the forest and they're, you know, they go right out there and start munching on native foods and, off they go. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, what a, what a pleasure that is. It's, um, I, you know, I get a lot of, I get a lot of personal benefit from that, knowing that my work makes a difference. It may not make a huge difference on the planet earth, but it makes a difference. It's reaching people, it's reaching animals, it's teaching conservation, um, it's supporting the food chain and the ecosystem. And that is important to me. So you both, um, Brought, brought up support systems, which is something else we wanted to ask about because it, it came up in the episode, right? Like you both have supportive spouses who kind of end up being like rehabilitation assistants by, not by choice, just kind of like, <laughs> hey honey, I want to rehab this animal uh, in my house. You're going to build me stuff and you're going to listen to me talk about it a lot as well, because it's what happens. So, uh, so supportive spouses seem important to get them to buy into this. Um, how are your spouses? Like, are they, are they enthusiastic? Have they come around? Have they, <laughs> I mean, I feel like they both, like Leslie, your husband and Linda, your husband probably both know more, way more about like individual bat and rabbit husbandry and like diets and all the really weird nuanced stuff they probably know way more than i do uh, <laughs> my husband has taken to answering bat questions before i can even jump in <laughs> like like if it's like you know like why is that bat doing that or you know where do you find bats he just jumps right in with the answer is not be like hey <laughs> <laughs> you know he he knows things now and he's also like his 
it did mesh a little bit with his interest because he's a big outdoors person and he's a photographer. Mm. So he gets to photograph some really interesting things that a lot of people don't get to see. And then like, I've always joked that I'm his spotter. So even when we would go hiking and stuff, like I would see stuff and then he would spend a half an hour photographing it while I would go find something else or do something else. Because honestly, photographers are picky people. And they will spend hours setting up a shot and you're like, hey, I wanted to get to the waterfall before dark. But anyway, I digress. But he does that. He, he you know, all I can say, like, I need a photograph of this bat's teeth so I can send it to the bat. And I get a macro shot of bat teeth that I can send to the bat. So super cool. And he built, um, well, he decided that he didn't want the rehab in the basement anymore of, the, of our house when we moved here. So we have this building that I'm sitting in built and he framed the entire thing out. Mm -hmm. And he is just incredibly handy. And so he builds things and he does all kinds of wonderful stuff. And now he educates the public about that. So it's awesome. <laughs> you got a good one. <laughs> hey, I've, I've known that before bats even came in. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So um, yeah, support support staff at home for sure. Um, my husband is also fortunately very handy. He's worked in the field of construction for decades. And so um, when I said, this is something I wanna do in this new house, um, he set to work to build a bunny, um, re we call it the bunny shed, but it's really a building attached to another building um, outside in the property. And so, um, you know, he framed it all in, it's got a roof and gutters and windows and electricity. And he went out there and, uh, and made the bunny building. So, um, I'm not sure if he understood what that meant long-term for him, but, um, he does now, he does, <laughs> he does now. And so, yeah, when I say, you know, so this year it was like, you know, I think we need more shelves in here and I need to move this stuff around. And so off he goes and, and builds more stuff for me and puts more stuff together. When I said I need a, you know, a rehab, not a rehab, I'm sorry, a, a release cage to be able to put outside and it need like to be light enough and I need to be able to do this and it's okay, so he builds that. Um, so um, I, his background isn't necessarily in the sciences or ecology, but he's very interested in that. You know, he's always wants to learn and is very interested in what's going on. Um, He's very supportive of stuff. And he too will also answer questions about people. Um, first thing being, um, can the baby be put back with its mother? Is there any way that we can not have this animal come into rehab? Uh, put the fawn <laughs> back, put the fawn back, put the squirrel back. So he's heard that enough to be able to say that pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, so big support, um, knows, you know, lots of p information about PPEs and making sure people are safe and, you know, um, all of that kind of basic stuff. And so it's been really important for us as a, as a team, as a couple in our relationship. Um, it's been a big deal for us moving forward. And it's been, um, I think it's been really good for him and for me to have that kind of teamwork and to be able to support each other in these endeavors. It is, you know, wildlife rehabilitation is, um, um, you know, people would call it a calling, people call it a hobby, people call it a profession, um, whatever you call it. Once you're into it, it becomes kind of a, a driving force in what you're doing and also in what other people around you are doing. Um, you know, when I mean, Leslie feeds bats around the clock, my bunnies require meals twice a day, they're crepuscular. And so, um, you know, I'm not going to be joining people for 6 p.m. dinners. Um, you know, these things are not going to happen, you know, in the morning, it's like, well, where, where is Linda? Well, she has bunny duty this morning um, and tonight and tomorrow morning and pretty much until September. Um, and so these are things that your life kind of revolves around and, and it works for, I mean, other people have other hobbies. That's how I look at it. You know, other people do different things and are busy with their stuff and I'm busy with doing my stuff. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been great. I think it's been a great education for both of us in learning different things. I now know lots more about construction um, and how to build stuff. So, you know, it's good teamwork. He's been a huge help. I couldn't do without him. Well, I think before we let you go, um, I'm curious to either of you, if there's somebody watching this right now who's thinking, you know, maybe I can do, maybe I can be a rehabber. Maybe I can be a rehabber. Maybe I can get into wildlife rehabilitation. Do you have any piece of advice to give them right now? Yeah, go find somebody who's doing it and hang out with them. Mm -hmm. um, 
not don't don't ask people in the middle of summer what or the middle of spring what rehabilitation is like because <laughs> you're just going to get a bunch of cranky sleep deprived answers and sometimes I, I i really worry about what rehabbers are telling each other because it's like oh you know you have to do it 24 hours a day and you can never have any friends and you can never go on vacation and and you know that's we tend to not put the most rewarding aspects of rehabilitation out there for the public and for, for p- potential um, new rehabbers. So recruitment is a really big issue for us. We need more rehabilitators. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting old. I had no intention of doing this to the point that I really was looking for, you know, every summer of, for the foreseeable future being taken up with baby bats. But the reality is there aren't enough people coming up through the ranks to be able to feel comfortable that we can turn this over at some point. So we really do need more people. And it is a wonderful thing to do. And the more people there are doing it, the fewer of us um, are getting burned out or, you know, that compassion fatigue is an issue across a lot of these caring professions. And I think it's an issue with rehabilitators and maybe that's why we're not putting our best foot forward when we're recruiting. But I think we need more people to spread this work out and then more people the more people are involved the more people are out there educating and so um go hang out with a rehabilitator find someone that you can just kind of get along with that you click with and and go hang out with them for a while and see you know what they're doing and then if you know if the spark is there um follow it and you know find the the good stuff in that other people are doing and, you know, make sure that there's, um, oh gosh, I don't want, <laughs> wait, let me restate that. Make sure that you, you A, know what you're getting into because we don't want anyone to be like, oh God, I had no idea that I signed up for, you know, 24 hour round the clock feedings. But at the same time, make sure you, you follow um, your rehabilitator connections through to that release point and to that point where they're, um, you know, they want to go outside with you and show you that it's their bats flying around out there in the night sky mm-hmm. in their yard, you know, see that piece of it. Um, and so I think that to me, that's it. Like make those connections, go out, watch and, and get an understanding of what it is we we're doing. And then come on, apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Leslie, you made some great points. I think, um, I think for me, um, the biggest issue that I find with people that are kind of interested, might want to do this, not really sure, is that they are overwhelmed with the amount of information that's out there and their level of responsibility. Um, and so I feel very strongly that you should, as Leslie pointed out, come and visit for a while. You know, there's a um, one of the new suggestions is that you do a category four for six months before you get your category one and actually take patients home with you. So a category four is kind of like the babysitter permit where they're not in your home, you go other places and take care of animals um, and you're permitted to do that by the state. Uh, a category one is where you're under a, an apprenticeship and you are gonna actually have them in your home um, and you are gonna be taking care of them under the supervision of your Um, sponsor. And so before you do that, to kind of get a feel for what these critters involve and what your resources really are. And so for me, one of the things about bunnies, in addition to being really interesting to me, was that I have a job. And so I don't have 24-7 all year long to take care of baby animals. It's just not something that I can do. Um, But I can take care of rabbits who, again, are only, they're they're crepusculars, they only feed twice a day. I can take care of them. These are, this is a species that works for me. Um, Other people, you know, they have the time, they have the space, they have the money to take care of other species, you know, fawns, for example, or birds or whatever their thing is, or possums that need much larger cages, they need much more space, they're gonna be in your care for longer. Rabbits go from birth to peace and out in four weeks. Um, Other people have different resources. So I think that that's something that I stress to people a lot is, well, what can you do? Um, Maybe you can transport animals, maybe you can answer phone calls, maybe you can return emails, maybe you can make little crocheted nests, maybe you can gather foods, maybe you can take care of a litter or two a summer. I have a friend, 
um, who takes care of raccoons and she takes one litter of raccoons a year and that's it. Um, and so she's a school teacher. So in the spring, they get a litter of raccoons. They bottle feed them, raise them, um, acclimate them and release them later on in the summer, early fall. And I think, you know, instead of people wanting to go out and do everything or all this stuff, why don't you understand your limitations and your available resources and do what you can do? Um, and let us teach you how to do that the, to the best of your ability. So that if, you know, I, cause I think if I had 10 people taking one litter of rabbits, you know, what would my summer be like? It wouldn't be like it is right now. Um, you know, so I just, you know, and so I feel like that's a big part that a lot of us don't really emphasize enough is know your, re your resources that you personally have time, money, and space. Um, and so, and you're going to learn that by taking care of animals in someone else's facility and see what that looks like for you. See whether or not that, you know, well, what species can I do? Um, and, and learn from that and kind of embrace that as being, this is my part of this conservation effort. This is my con contribution. Um, and really, and, and it is, it's so fulfilling. It's so wonderful to see these little babies grow up um, and be released back into the wild to be what they're supposed to be. Um, that is tremendously fulfilling. And I, I feel like that's the biggest aspect of kind of getting people on board is just really understanding what can what can I do and making that your own. Right. And never feel like it's not enough. No. I think that's the other thing too, that a lot of people feel like, well, if I'm only taking, you know, six baby squirrels a year, am I really helping? And Yay, you, are. you are helping. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're... If you're going out and gathering a box of greens and taking them to Linda, you're helping. If you're, um, you know, going to pick up something for a rehabber who can't leave the house because they're feeding. I mean, and some of these animals, you have to go quite a distance to, to, to get them into care. And, and we do get calls from people who don't have cars, who can't leave their job, who are elderly and are afraid to drive at night. I mean, these things happen and to have people willing to go help with that situation, you're helping. So I think, yeah, know your resources, know what you can contribute and then contribute um, in whatever level, level you can. And then if, like I said, if that spark lights, come on, we'll help you, we'll help you get into it because we would like to retire someday. <laughs> Someday. Yeah. Yeah, someday. <laughs> uh, well, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, if there's anyone out there watching who wants to get involved, be a wildlife rehabilitator, or at least see what it's about, or, or like Leslie said, you know, collect greens or drive animals around or whatever, no matter what your level of interest is, uh, we can find a job for you. And there are amazing wildlife rehabilitators all around the state. Uh, Leslie and Linda are both here uh, in, in the local area. So very amazing resources if you're into bunnies or bats. Uh, but also in this episode, we had um, Lynn Oliver up in the Winchester area and Dana Lusher down in the Tidewater area. So we kind of covered the state. And um, yeah, uh, there's certainly some great rehabbers to get involved with. And the need is very much there. Uh, wildlife keep, keep being in need and um, always seems to get a little bit busier and busier each year. So. Lots of good resources out there. Um, Leslie, Linda, thank you guys so much for joining us. And this has been Untamed Unfiltered. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Amanda. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. One, two, three.